The big story in education, of course, is that foreign universities have been greenlit to come to India amid a big debate for and against. I'm Barkhadat, you're with the Mojo story. In moments from now, we'll, of course, be joined by the UDC chairperson to talk about this big move, the decision by the government to greenlight the entry of foreign universities to India. Basically, it means Harvard, NYU, Yale, anybody actually really who's in the top sort of 500 universities is well regarded globally will now possibly get permission to set up their campuses in India. We're not talking about online education. We're actually talking about offline campuses. However, many questions have been raised by domestic universities. Will the rules that are applied be different? Will the policies, for example, on affirmative action and quotas be different? What if there are parts of the curriculum that actually um, go against India's national interests? The UGC chairperson has made it clear that the curriculums and the rules will have to be within the framework, of course, of Indian law. But could that create a tricky situation? There are many, many questions to be asked. But if this does happen, it is, of course, a very, very big dramatic move. Many of these university campuses, for example, have come uh, to countries in, um, in, in, in the Gulf nations. Uh, you have, for example, a New York University campus in Abu Dhabi. So this is already happening. Uh, this is a change uh, that is happening. Um, this is a byproduct of globalization. And can India ignore these winds of global change? Well, to raise some of the questions and also understand the issue better, let's introduce our newsmaker on the program today, the UGC chairperson, uh, Mr. M. Jagdesh Kumar. It's very good to see you, sir. Uh, thank you for making the time. Namaskar. Uh, let me start by asking you the thought behind going ahead with this. Uh, this is something that has come up before. Even in, in the previous government, there was talk about doing this and it didn't get the sort of green light. Now the government, you, all of you seem to be very much in favor of it. What is the logic? Mm -hmm. Barkha, we need to look at this regulation of foreign universities, letting foreign universities to set up campuses in India in the bigger, bigger picture of what is happening in the higher education arena following the NEP 2020. Lots of reforms are being introduced in higher education, primarily to provide more freedom, flexibility, and choices to our students. And towards that end, internationalization of higher education in India uh, is also one of the uh, guidelines provided to us in the national education policy. And it has two components. We want to internationalize our own domestic education by encouraging our universities to set up their campuses abroad. UGC is always already in the advanced stages of preparing a regulation towards that end. The other one is to let the foreign universities to set up their campuses here in India, primarily for the simple reason that the students will have additional options of uh, accessing high quality higher education. So this is definitely not to reverse the trend of Indian students going abroad to study in foreign universities. Those students will continue to go because they go for uh, a, 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 you know, multiple reasons. Um, the job empl employability opportunities after their study, working in a different uh, cultural setup, uh, and so on. So those students will continue to go. But however, uh, there are many other students who may not be able to go because of the financial and family reasons. And also those who wish to go. Uh, but if the foreign higher educational institutions are available in within India, they may wish to study itself. So it is only providing multiple options uh, to the students. Yeah. Now, many of the sort of Indian universities are among those protesting. Uh, this happens every time change comes. So this is not surprising. Uh, but, sir, uh, let me ask you, you know, one of the one of the complaints by the Indian universities is uh, the foreign universities will have more freedom than they have, whether it's in setting fees or in setting curriculum. How do you address this question? Well, there is a lot of discussion that is going on um, in the media. Uh, in the printed newspapers and so on, which is a very welcome thing. It's a very healthy trend that is happening. Um, but however, I have not really uh, come across a case where uh, UGC has actually tried to regulate the tuition fee. UGC has no rules and regulations towards that end. Um, if at all there are any regulations of uh, 
the tuition fees that is done by the uh, state governments, because uh, in certain states they have the tuition fee regulatory uh, councils. So we don't uh, regulate, and the same kind of autonomy is given even to the foreign universities. So, so you are saying that the UGC doesn't interfere with the fee structure of Indian universities uh, either. And of course, there are now a number of private Indian universities that do, uh, in a sense, set their own fees. What about policies such as affirmative action, uh, reservation? That's also an unclear space. You know, what happens to scheduled castes and scheduled tribes? There is an Indian law, a framework for uh, education, and even private universities uh, sort of are answerable uh, in that ambit. What happens to affirmative action? Uh, most international universities have uh, some kind of uh, need-based uh, partial and full scholarships to take care of the interests of such students. Um, that is one affirmative action most universities have. That is the reason why in our regulation also we have introduced a class that based on uh, an assessment process, the uh, need-based partial and full scholarships can be given to the students from the university's own resources. So this class is already there. So uh, explain this, you know, if mm -hmm. there is a contradiction between Indian law and the universities as they are used to, to functioning and they all have their own policies, how will those two be reconciled? Uh, could you give me an example of where such a clash can come? So, for example, uh, most American universities have their own understanding of affirmative action. We actually have stipulated quota systems, for example, right? Um, uh, we have now an EWS uh, case that is being determined in, in, in the Supreme Court. So there are many things happening with our uh, uh, sort of debate around affirmative action, which is very different from how, let's say, the Americans understand uh, affirmative action. Ours is driven by caste, theirs is driven by race, just to take a, right. one example. So mm -hmm. how do they adapt to the cultural context or the socioeconomic realities, for example, of their host countries? See, even without the American university campuses being established here, are these discussions not going on among yes. the academic communities? So the debate discussion on various academic topics are encouraged even in our Indian universities, just as is happening in the uh, uh, global universities. So that kind of freedom of expression when we are discussing academic matters um, is, uh, is highly important in all of our educational institutions. So I don't think UGC will play any role uh, in putting boundaries that your discussion has to be only within these boundaries. What about uh, academic research? So, for example, uh, you know, in India, and rightfully so, uh, when we have a map that doesn't depict India accurately. You have the flag behind you right now. Uh, you know, our symbols of nationhood, when they are not represented um, as, as, as we believe them to be accurate. We object even to Google or even to The Economist magazine. Uh, but researchers, academic campuses sometimes have their own ideas. So they could be, for example, tomorrow, somebody who has a certain view on what's happening, let's say, in Kashmir or Jammu. It doesn't reconcile with the Indian position. What happens then? Oh, you see such articles even in Indian newspapers. <laughs> there are di di there are divergent uh, views. Uh, yes. Even in our academic institutions, such a discussions take place. Uh, so, and also, Barka, you see, when I go to a different country, uh, I respect their laws. I respect their sentiments. Uh, is it not reciprocal when we each uh, when we visit each other's countries, when we work in each other's countries? We yes. uh, integrate with the local culture, with the local sentiments, and live there uh, uh, peacefully. The same thing is expected for any global citizen to respect each other, uh, each other's sentiments and their national values. Yeah. How do you make uh, this campus, let's say Harvard or Yale or Columbia or NYU or any, any other university, great university of the world, <laughs> let's say everything goes through, these campuses are here in the next couple of years. How do you make them affordable, accessible uh, to also those who are economically deprived or socially marginalized? Um, Barka, you have taken the names of Harvard, Cambridge, yeah. Stanford, and so on. But yeah. we are saying that uh, any university within the top 500 world rankings, yeah. they are eligible uh, to set up their campuses here. And also, please remember, 
that uh, out of 4.5 lakh students who left our country last year uh, to study in foreign universities not all of them have joined in harvard or cambridge or yes, stanford of course. a small of percentage course. have gone uh, so therefore um, let's not uh, just use some ivy league names and say that uh, only when they come here um, this regulation is a success, a success or not uh, we course. are looking at a, a we are looking at a comprehensive list of universities uh, who may show interest to come here and we will try to encourage them finally my last question sir is what is the win win for india one is you know more options for students but you know it's all, it could also be argued that when you look at today uh, the major ceos uh, of let's say the american big tech companies they're all kids who studied in india's higher education institute several of them are from the iits others are from the iims so you know there's a great higher education story in india of course there're not enough seats for applicants right there's so many people who apply and such few people who get in so this arrival of foreign universities is not a comment on the quality of india's higher education as some might think it is absolutely not our indian educational system is one of the uh, biggest in the world and uh, you can see our alumni how well they are doing across the globe uh, yes. and they attribute their success to their school education and college college education in, in india but barkha the challenge with us is that uh, we have millions of students already we have 40 million students in our higher education which is going to double soon so how do we provide opportunities to them to access high quality education one of course is to strengthen our own educational institutions by expanding our own network of uh, higher educational institutions which we are doing at certain pace which is physically feasible uh, the other option is to let some of these foreign universities to come here in fact in the last budget too uh, the finance minister mentioned about the importance of foreign direct uh, investment in education sector in india and a recent survey uh, also shows that the top 200 universities in the world have shown india as an ideal destination for the simple reason that unlike the countries that you have mentioned where some of the american universities have uh, gone and set up campuses there our country is a different uh, uh, you know uh, different example altogether because we have highly motivated and aspiration aspirational um, students who are in millions and millions and when the foreign universities come here they can actually tap some of this talent um, that is one of the uh, win situation for the foreign universities because they are also looking for highly talented students across the globe and as you know indian students constitute one of the uh, largest components of this input that goes to the foreign universities and what is the win for our country of course additional choices to our students and also when better institutions are uh, in the vicinity working with us um, there is going to be healthy competition uh, among the institutions and our institutions also have to pull up and improve their own uh, academic programs in order to remain relevant in the education sector so this uh, win win situation is on both sides if they come here that that i have to say i do agree with competition has always improved quality before we let you go sir how soon are you hopeful of this actually becoming operational um barkha you know all these things take time uh, yes. especially the regulations uh, we are sending to top universities across the globe sending to the ambassadors of foreign countries uh, who are located in new delhi and and then once the final regulations come Uh, the individual institutions in the foreign countries they have to discuss in their own uh, statutory bodies and take a decision to come here and once they decide that um, the application process uh, and the final decision will take about 90 days and then we will give them two years period for the letter of intent to establish their campus uh, to acquire land uh, construct buildings appoint faculty members and so on so i uh, hope that in next 2 3 years uh we may see the first campuses being established uh, in our country well that is an exciting time i think for india's higher education and 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 congratulations on moving in that direction uh, mr jitesh kumar pleasure talking to you and we'll continue to follow up as the story develops namaskar sir thank you so much it's great to see you here thank you for watching our work 
If you haven't subscribed yet, don't forget to click the bell icon and subscribe to Mojo Story and support independent, robust journalism.